good for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is a time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line To my man Sammy, got it Sammy. off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is the time. No, we no stop. to listen to the, the sick, sick podcast. podcast the eye test with pierre mcguire and jimmy murphy the stanley cup winning colorado avalanche 
And after 22 years, Raymond Moore! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. And welcome to another edition of the Eye Test here on the Sick Podcast Network. He's Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. And Pierre, before we get started here, we have some news to announce. Uh, the Eye Test is heading off on the road again. Yeah. I can't wait to get uh, You're just so excited because it's in Western Mass. It's in yes. Springfield. I might have to call Sheriff Ash to take care of you because you might start some shenanigans. <laughs> uh, remember when we talked about the Ash family and what a great legacy they've been throughout the hockey world, yes. whether it was playing at Clarkson or Bowdoin, uh, Boston College, College. Yep. Avon Old Farms. Like These guys are legends in Western Mass. Now you've got Ryan Leonard, who's obviously playing at Boston College, is a Western Mass guy. But I'm going to call Sheriff Ash to get you like a ride into town. <laughs> All right. You know who else could probably help us out around there is our good friend Billy Garen that we had on this show, Wilbraham. Yeah, Billy, Billy might have a few things to say about exactly. it. Scotty so, Lachance might have a few things to say about it. And I'll give you a name that you don't even know that I recruited to Babson College, Diesel Dan Hunter. He was a good player. I know you don't. He's a little okay. older than you, but he was a good player for us. So I'm always appreciative of all the players I had a chance to work with or recruit. Well, let's tell the folks right now to our listeners and viewers, we're happy to announce that on Thursday at noon Eastern, we will be broadcasting live from the Tap Sports Bar inside the MGM Casino in downtown Springfield, right around the corner from the Mass Mutual Center, where the regionals will take place with UMass Denver as the first game at 2 p.m. And then at 5.30, you got Cornell and Maine. Really looking forward to it. So for anyone that's going to be in the area that's coming out there for the games, Come on by. It's going to be a fun time. We're going to have a lot of UMass guests join us. The UMass AD, Ryan Bamford, will be joining us live in person, as will the head of their uh, hockey alumni and UMass alumni uh, out there. It's going to it's going to be a good time. And, you know, as you just said, there is a rich history in Western mm -hmm. Massachusetts of hockey and in the Connecticut area, as we've discussed. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to getting back out to Another one of my second homes. I spent many years there, obviously, going to UMass and then lived in Holyoke, uh, lived in Springfield. So uh, really looking forward to seeing some old faces there and, and talking some college hockey and and getting this thing going underway. I was told, Pierre, um, by people at UMass that their tickets sold out within six hours. Six hours. But I'll tell you what, it's not just going to be UMass fans. I'm told that you, uh, you Maine and Cornell are really going to flood the place. There will be Denver fans, but I think in terms of uh, you know teams coming in from out of town, uh, you Maine and Cornell will have a good contention as well. It should be fun. Pierre, you saw Cornell just less than a week ago, a few days ago, uh, at the ACACs there, so you know what they're going to bring. We've had Ben Barra, coach of Maine, on as well. Uh, we're now going to be joined within the next five to ten seven minutes we will have the ad of the university of denver josh burlow join us he actually worked at umass as well also worked at notre dame uh minnesota duluth as well so he'll be joining us to talk about uh the denver perspective from this regional i am very excited pierre can't wait to get out there and look i don't know about you but i love doing these road trips with you I love the road. I miss being on the road. No, uh, they're all fun. We had a great time in Montreal. We'll have a great time, uh, obviously, at uh, the tap at the MGM. Um, the one thing I will tell you, I'm pretty familiar with the area, uh, especially the Holyoke, East Hampton area. For eight summers, I ran the Berkshire Hockey School with some unbelievable names oh, yeah. uh, at the Wilson Northampton School. It was delightful. We used to spend eight weeks a summer there. Oh, wow. uh, back in the day, and it was an awesome experience. And uh, I worked with Brian Petrovic, who was a legendary goalie at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. and did a lot of good stuff in the NHL and the AHL and, and even in the East Coast Hockey League. I think he's semi-retired up in Biddeford, Maine right now. Uh, but did a lot of stuff with a lot of really good hockey people there um, for eight summers. So I really enjoyed myself. And I know the area, Jimmy, pretty well. You know, I lived in North Granby when I coached the Hartford Whalers in North Granby, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. Which is right on the uh, Massachusetts, I know, Connecticut border. I know exactly border. where it is, Pierre. <laughs> Actually, North Granby's in Connecticut, but it's right on the Massachusetts border. Yep. You, know who my neighbor, you know who my neighbor was there? Take a guess. You'll never get it, but I'll tell you anyways. Uh, wait, wait. One guess. Is it is it connected to the Whalers, or? 
No, it's connected to a very major, significant television show. Hmm. I, I'm never going to guess then. Radar O'Reilly, Gary no. Burke. Wow. He was my neighbor there. <laughs> I'm not crazy. kidding you. Is he from there? Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty oh. cool. I remember coming back from a game really late one night. I don't know. We might have been in New York or New Jersey. We took the bus back and... You know, I probably went in the office and maybe watched the first period or two, and then I drove home. And the next morning, I got up really early, and I saw him in the street. I'm like, hey, you're Radar O'Reilly. He goes, I am. <laughs> oh, it was pretty good. Good stuff. Yeah, you know, Pierre, I, I remember uh, being out there when UMass became – my freshman year – was their first season back as a D1 program. Was Joey, Mal, was Joey Malin the coach then? Joey, Joey Malin was a coach. Yeah. Dale yep. Dunbar was there. Yep. Dale, what, the other way, shout out to Dale Dunbar. Oh, I love Dale talked Dunbar. about awesome human beings and great hockey people. Yep. Dale Dunbar is an awesome guy. You know, no, He was great to me. Great BU player, played in Vancouver, hard-edged guy, but salt-of-the-earth person. He and Mike Ruzioni are like this. They're so yeah. tight. I'm a big fan of Dale. Dale's an awesome guy. He lives, you know, just on, on the water close to um, – where is he close to? Right near the airport, not far from the airport. Yeah, in I think he's in the north, like the north shore there, eh? Like up he there, is, like, a uh, little, but, and all that. Yeah. Just the nicest nicest man, nicest person, really good person. Yeah, you know, he he's kind of here. We've had that discussion before on the show. I forget who we had on as a guest when we were talking about it, but that, you know, a lot of the tough guys on the ice – seem to always be the nicest guys off. And he he's the perfect example of that. You know I'm what I mean? I'm so glad you said that. He's just yeah. an awesome person. Uh, so, so I just remember I get, being there. Sometimes I get to visit with him on uh, July 4th, which oh. is fun. <laughs> nice. There you go. There's a nice little gathering there. Um, I know Ray Shiro's there. I think he and Dale played together at the New Hampton School. Mike Ruzioni's there. Um, okay. A lot, a lot of the BU guys go, and then they invite the St. Lawrence guys over from time to time. There you go, and my friend. You've even had some Colgate guys there, so it's pretty good. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I just remember the, the, that year, and, you know, this those years, they were lean years. Obviously, they were getting back into the hockey East, and, you know, they were at the bottom for a while. So to be there on Thursday with them hosting a regional pair, it's, it's just – it means a lot to me as an alum, and I know it means a lot to a lot of people in that area, not just UMass alums. They're, they've got a lot of fans out there because once they lost the Whalers – UMass hockey is the closest thing that whole area has really, Pierre. So they've gained a lot of fans that way. They Obviously, they have the Springfield AHL team, but uh, they've really gained a lot of fans in that area. I know a lot of people are really excited about this. So it's going to be a great celebration of Western Mass hockey community and of NCAA hockey. And uh, one of the teams that's going to be coming in there to try, try and spoil it is Denver University uh, and the Pioneers and their athletic director. I think we have him right now. He's joining us right now. That's Josh Burlow. Do we have him? There we go. Hey, Josh, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Now, Josh, I we're good. We're just talking about, you know, the uh, the hockey community in Western Mass, and you were part of that for a while, weren't you? Well, I don't know that I was too big a part of it, but I did do my undergrad at the University of Massachusetts at the time that they restarted the program. Oh, so we were there at the same time. Yeah, and yep. uh, Joe Mallon was leading the charge, getting mm -hmm. in the hockey east out of the gate, and saw some of those early years. And it's been impressive to see where they are today, and and the national stage that they've had success upon. Yeah, that's great. Go ahead, Pierre. Josh, you've been fortunate enough to be at Notre Dame. You really led an unbelievable team at Minnesota Duluth, and now obviously at Denver. You've been at some high-profile hockey programs. Why is Denver so special to you? Well, you know, I think it really boils down to two things. First, it's, it's history and tradition. It's something that I really buy into and, and seeing what sports does for people in their lives and helps them develop and grow as a person. And that's something that Denver hockey has been doing for a, a really long time. Uh, the other piece, and, and I think about what's special about Denver and having seen, as you said, it from a few different lenses, UMass, Notre Dame, Duluth, is the way we do it here with high academic achievement, great social citizens, and helping our student athletes succeed at the next level. Whether that's in hockey or not, we can all rattle off great Denver players that have succeeded at the highest level. But what I get to see behind the scenes are how these student athletes who maybe don't go pro in hockey have incredible lives 
uh, in, in successes and, and really are pioneers in so many different ways. Hey, Jimmy, you know what else? I got to say this about Josh and his programs. They're, they're lacrosse programs big time. They're, they're extremely good in lacrosse. And everybody like talks about the hockey program, which is great. Their lacrosse program's elite. Am I correct, Josh? Very correct. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. We bumped into them during my time at Notre Dame with our, our legendary coach here, Bill Tierney, who uh, retired last year. We hired a, a former Pio, uh, Matt Brown, who, who had led us to a, a number one ranking earlier this year. And our women's team coming off their first Final Four last year, Basically, we started the season with two top 10 lacrosse programs in the country, and that's a pretty special thing. Jimmy, before you jump in, I just want to ask uh, Josh one more thing. The CC Denver rivalry, is it back on now? It's it's definitely on. There's no question. Um, you know, CC's had some, some resurge of success in the last couple of years, and uh, we, we've heard a little chirping from their fans that maybe we hadn't heard in the, in the last – last decade, but that rivalry is alive and well. We did a game last year at Ball Arena, 18,000 fans there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we set the all-time Magnus attendance record a couple weeks ago, ending the season, a uh, regular season with CC here. So that that rivalry is is heated right back up, and credit to them for their success. Nice. I'm glad you brought up Ball Arena. It was going to be one of my questions is, um, how important has it been for you? And Not that they weren't already, but since you've been there, to integrate uh, your sports programs into the community of Denver and also working with the pro teams there a lot to kind of, you know, cross promote each other. Yeah, no question. That's critically important. You know, one of the things that I think is unique about the University of Denver College Athletics in the city of in Metro of Denver is we're the only Division One athletic department within the Denver Metro. So you look at Boston, mm -hmm. Dallas, L.A., there's a lot of Division One athletic departments. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that there aren't some great Division Two athletic departments here, but we are the only D1 department uh, NCAA in, in Denver Metro. And that's, that provides a cool opportunity. It's a great pro sports town, but there yeah. are times that college sports offer something a little different. It's a little more intimate. The student athletes can be uh, role models in a, in a more direct fashion to families who come to games. So we've really tried to own that uh, a bit more intentionally. And with, I think we've got five teams in the top 15 and six or eight in the top 40. So, uh, it's it's just such a neat thing to be able to offer that opportunity and 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 be those role models and be that that intimate sports experience where uh, you can get up close to our student athletes and and learn about them and what they're going to do in their lives and and they get to know uh, the community and they can read in schools and they can do habitat projects and and get reminded one of the things that I really believe breeds success in college athletics are our student athletes being engaged in the community. And, and getting a little bit recentered, getting a little bit of a break from there, the stresses of academics and competition and, and do some goodwill and, and some community service. And that's something that's really important to our student athletes here at Denver. Josh, I wanted to ask, you know, you're going to a regional that's got a super high end coaching value. You know, I think about Greg Carvel at UMass Amherst. I think about Ben Barr at University of Maine. I think about Mike Schaefer, who's been 27 years as a head coach at Cornell. I used to recruit against him, so I, I know what he's like. He's a heck of a coach. And then you got your boy Wonder uh, and David Carl. Tell us about David Carl. For those that don't know, I know David, obviously, and I know the way he coaches, but tell the viewing public out there about David Carvel, or David Car uh, Carl, excuse me, Greg Carvel, David Carroll. So tell me about him. Yeah, you know, David's a really impressive human being, high intellect, super passionate about this institution. Uh, obviously, I think most people know his story, but was committed to play here, wasn't able to. His brother won a Hobie Award here, um, and he is a pioneer through and through and sort of ascended in a unique way as a student coach, uh, an assistant coach, and, and took over. And I had seen him through the lens of, of being a competitor, but I'd been in annual meetings with him, was always impressed with David. Now that I've had the opportunity over the almost the last two seasons uh, to work with him. He is uh, as smart of a coach that's out there, as committed as a, of a coach that's out there, has an incredible ability to see the national landscape and the big picture and be looking around the corner a little bit when that skill has probably never been more important in college athletics to be able to look around the corner a little bit. Um, no nonsense, direct, uh, cares about his guys. Guys love playing for him. And, and I just... I had really high expectations about what it would be like to work with him, having worked with Jeff Jackson, having worked with Scott Sandlin, 
and I've really enjoyed our, our time together. And he has a bright, bright future and really wants to do as much as possible to, to uh, accomplish national championships here at Denver and uh, just love working with him. Hey, Jimmy, pretty good hockey family. His brother, Matt, won the Obi Baker, played in the yeah. NHL for a long time. I broadcast a lot of his games. But they're not from, like, Edina, Minnesota, or Eden Prairie, or Boston. They're from Alaska, Jimmy. They're yeah. from Alaska, these kids. Like, it's, it's a great story. <laughs> good stuff. It, it, so, Josh, where, just so our listeners get a little background on you, where, did, where are you from, and then how did you get your start in this field? Sure. Uh, uh, I grew up just outside of Providence, Rhode Island, a little town called Warren. Um, oh, yeah. Mom worked at Brown University, and, and I went out to UMass Amherst as an undergrad because I really wanted to work in sports and, and appreciated what sports did for people's lives. I kind of grew up not as a rink rat, but more as a rat at a golf course, and, and the golf <laughs> pro there was my father figure to me. So. Um, and, and, and out at UMass, I really had a, an incredible experience in one of the oldest and most respected sports administration programs in the country, right. got involved in the athletic department, uh, and through connections there, had the opportunity to go and, and do an internship and a master's at the University of Notre Dame, and, and had a great experience there. I uh, worked for some incredible national thought leaders of today in the athletic department there, Kevin White, Jack Swarbrick, or some names in college athletics that are well known. And then... Um, Got a phone call from a search firm, and I always enjoyed being around hockey, and I got a phone call from a search firm. I think we were 33 or 34 at the time about the University of Minnesota Duluth want to have a conversation with me, and I, and I, I chatted with my wife. I said, well, why not? Let's go up there. Let's see what that's like. And we just had an exceptional run there. We loved Duluth, great community, great hockey town. We had our teams doing really, really well. And then um, – you know, we, we enjoyed it, but then Denver called and it was just another opportunity to be part of something special. And we're just loving our time here. Hey, Jimmy, he's under, Jimmy, he's underselling Minnesota Duluth back to back national champs. And they took a third trip. They were like Tampa Bay lightning in college hockey. He's kind of underselling. The only thing he's not telling the truth about, and Josh, forgive me. Uh, it's a little bit chilly there in January when you got to walk from the parking lot. The <laughs> in the rain. Yeah, the, you know, I made that walk a couple of times, and I'm telling you right now, when you're follically impaired, you need a lid. <laughs> the, the, the winters are legitimate, Pierre. I'll, I'll give you that one. The winters are legitimate. <laughs> nice, nice. And De but Denver, you must love Denver, though. It's one of my yeah. favorite cities to visit. You know, when I'm on the road. Uh, yeah, a thousand percent. In a lot of ways, there there's similarities to both of the institutions that I spend time at. There's a you know, private elite academics here, really high competitive athletic uh, uh, aspirations and, and proof of concept. You know, we had some ruggedness in northern Minnesota. We had some rocky ruggedness here. We had Northwoods ruggedness. We had four inches of snow yesterday morning. So, you know, th <laughs> those two places kind of come together and they make Denver a really comfortable fit for, for me and my family. And we're loving it here. And, and I'm just so impressed with the quality of the university and the coaches and all the reasons that we wanted to be a part of this place have really proven true. And we're going to see that in the, on the ice uh, in, in uh, about 48 hours. And tell us about this team. For those that haven't watched Denver this year, uh, what makes Denver so good this year? What, what's their strong points? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'll leave most of that to the coaches, but from someone that's been to a, a lot of college hockey games and a lot of big college hockey games, uh, this is a young team, a lot of speed, a lot of talent. Uh, they believe in themselves, and they're on, a, they're on a mission to continue to further the legacy that is Denver hockey and get that 10th championship. So I, I think you're going to see a, a really high compete level, a really high ski le skill level, very well coached. Uh, and, and you're going to see, a, a, frankly, an all-business team. They're there with a purpose, and uh, they're excited to be there. And it's an honor and a privilege for those young men to try to further, uh, again, the history and tradition here. Um, and, and they're going to have some smiles along the way. But there's, there's a reason that they're there, and they know exactly what that is. Josh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you, you talk about legacy and tradition. I agree with that. I, I spent a lot of time around your, your program and around the city there. Um, how do you guys tie into Europe so well? You have so many good Finns, so many good Swedes. Yeah. Is there an alumni connection? How did that happen? Because in the old days, it was all Western Canada. That sure. I mean, you go back to the old days in the 60s and the early 70s, it was all Western Canada all the time. How did they develop the, the Swedish-Finnish connection at DU? Yeah, I would say a couple things. One, there's a tradition of it. There are alums. Uh, we also have Nordic and Alpine skiing, which mm -hmm. has connections 
in that part of the world. Yeah. So I, I think there's been a tradition of it. Uh, and it's something our, our coaches are very discerning in their recruiting and they've got great relationships. And our staff has three former division one head coaches on it. Um, that's not something you see everywhere. So mm -hmm. if you look at those dynamics of we've got a tradition of doing that, we do have a strong alumni presence in that part of the world. Uh, and we can just continue to identify great fits for this university. And our young folks are going on to do good things. You put that together. It's not that hard to keep it rolling. I hear you. Now, will you be out there, Josh, or no? Yeah, the team, the team was wheels up. But the glamorous role of the AD is I had work and meetings today. So I'm going <laughs> to take a 6 o'clock commercial flight, get into Bradley at about midnight, and jump in the rental car. So while All this right. is a great gig, it's not as glamorous at times as people may perceive. Do you want me to have some Antonio's pizza waiting for you or what? It's been a while, but I definitely know that spot. <laughs> so jo I got to ask you this, Josh, because you've been at you know Notre Dame, you've been at Minnesota Duluth, Denver, obviously, a lot of high-profile players. Is there one player's name that you hear about from the old days? Like I would tell you right now, if I was a fan of DU High, I'd be thinking Craig Patrick, and I'd be thinking you know Keith Magnuson. Is there one name that pops up amongst the the, the older fans of DU Hockey? Well, you know, for me, I, I got to go with Ron Graham. Um, the goalie. You know, goalie you go. uh, played for Johnny's the Johnny's dad, right? You know, yeah. I, I just – I got to go with Ron. Ron was a longtime administrator here, heart and soul of the program. And yeah. as a young, incredibly naive, borderline stupid athletic director at 34 years old, uh, it was the first year of the NCHC that I went up to Duluth. And, and Ron was in a key role at the time. I learned a ton from Ron. He actually made the trip with us last week. Yeah. But uh, I got to go with Ron because he really represents the heart and soul of Denver hockey. And there's been so many great ones. But I've known Ron for well over a decade. And uh, he really represents all that we seek to be and achieve. Jimmy, just so you understand, the Grams are gigantic. In oh, I know. Seattle. And Charlotte, I know Ron, Charlotte Ronnie's wife, was yep. a great yep. man, woman, I should say to Pierre Lacroix. I mean, the Colorado Avalanche are what they are, and a lot of it was Charlotte Graham. And, you know, Johnny, their son, obviously, was a tremendous goalie in the NHL. Mm -hmm. But but I was so – that was awesome, by the way, Josh. I'm so glad you talked about Ronnie. I'm going to date myself. The late Ralph Backstrom and Ronnie Graham were at the coaches' convention in Naples. I was coaching at St. Lawrence, and it was Joe Marsh and I playing Ronnie Graham and the late Ralph Backstrom in tennis. And Joe kept saying – that backstrom's too fast. I said, watch this. And I got a return to serve, and I drilled it right at him. He was so ticked off at me. And I just remember Ronnie and I had a you know, drink afterwards. He goes, oh, Ralph was not happy with you. I said, no, I think he was. <laughs> uh, We love Ron, and he's just the embodiment of Denver hockey and continues to be uh, around a ton. His seats are right in front of me, and I love chatting with him. And Charlotte's still doing the abs thing. I don't oh, think they're yeah. going to let her ever retire. She's a key piece of that. She's just an amazing. incredible hockey family and and just really espouse the values of of, of hockey all right this has Good been job. so thank you josh yeah. this has been just awesome. for me a walk down memory lane just some of the names you brought up so class of you to join us can't wait to see you in springfield um i'm surprised you didn't jump on the charter with the fellas i mean you could have worked that out i think couldn't you or no yeah i got somebody's got to do the work right so, <laughs> i'm a blue collar kid i can't help it. god bless you my man god bless you listen we'll see you uh thursday my friend safe travels and good luck thanks for having me take care guys all Bye, right Josh. thank you Join us uh, here, the athletic director of the University of Denver. I was going to make a wager. Maybe we'll do it when we get there. But Oh, uh, you know what, Jimmy? Just when, He's great. That was so that great. Was he just said about Ronnie Graham, yeah. a former Bruin, by the way. Yep. I know. You I know? met him I met him when I first it's, covered the Bruins. Oh, uh, my gosh. What, a, what an awesome human. And, and his wife, Charlotte. I mean, I can't get into it because it's confidential. But I did some work with Charlotte, and I, I would just tell you, she is off the charts. She's not a little bit good. Like, she's really good. And yeah. I can't say enough about the way she's helped hockey grow, not just in Denver, but the whole state of Colorado. Yeah. She, she's an amazing woman. She truly is. And, and she's meant so much to hockey there. I know Pierre Lacroix couldn't do anything without her. I know that. And he, if he was still alive, he would tell you the same thing. Oh, that's great. That's good stuff. Yeah. And, and yeah, the Grams are a great hockey family. I was glad he brought them up as well. Good stuff. And look, here they're they're a tough team. This is this is I I think I mean I'm not just saying this because I'm UMass and all that, but this is maybe the toughest 
or one of the toughest regions out there. I think. Yeah, I don't know about. Lose, what do you think, Sioux Falls? I'm going to say Maryland Heights is probably the Maryland difficult Heights, okay. one because you got you got North Dakota, Michigan. Nobody knows how it's going to go, and you got Michigan State and Western. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, that's okay. good point. That's cuckoo crazy hard. Whoever, whomever comes out of there, I hope they have enough bodies to play at the XL Energy Center. I'm not kidding you. Like, oh, that's a really, really tough regional. Yeah. Really tough. I'll tell you. Now, I'm, I can't think off the top of my head, Pierre, but did Denver won a uh, championship at uh, TD Boston, Garden? Did they not? Boston Garden. They yeah. beat Michigan in the final. And uh, the kid, Divine, that's got all the goals for him, he's just a young kid then. He uh, – you know, you could see back then he was ready to take it to another level. He was ready to go. Yep. Good stuff. Good stuff. And Pierre, um, we are going to switch gears, I think, right now and talk a little pro hockey, my friend. I like it. Because uh, you and I watched those games last night, and there were two consistent threads that we had throughout our conversation. One was some of these teams, ne neither one looked like they wanted the game at times. And it was a, it was a little sort of kind of lackadaisical hockey at times. But on the complete opposite end of that spectrum was one Anse Kopitar, who is just ultimately in beast mode right now, Pierre. I mean, I don't think he had – look, we agreed yesterday Nathan McKinnon is, is hands down the front runner for the heart. You'd have to have McDavid in there, Sidney Crosby, um, and, and maybe a couple other players. But, I mean, I, I would think with the way Kopitar has played in the last month or so, he's got into the top ten at least – and he should not be undervalued for what he's doing with the LA Kings right now. No, just look at the impact he's had on Quinton Byfield. Look at the impact he's had on Adrian Kempe. He's been phenomenal. Last night he was great. He, he uh, Anse was so good. Yeah. And to me, the, the thing is, is that, you know, he was drafted in the same draft as Sidney Crosby 2005. It's not like he's just starting. Yeah. And what people – we all know the Stanley Cups. Everybody knows it's two cups in 12 and in 14 with L.A. But they don't talk about all the rigorous, tough playoff battles they had all those years. Yeah. There were a lot of hard miles. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, I remember games with San Jose. I remember games with Anna. I remember series with St. Louis. What about you Chicago? Know, Chicago? I was just going to go there. Chicago. I mean, to be at the level he's at, and, and to see where he still is, is amazing. And I want to give credit where credit's due. In 2005, the nuclear winter, I spent two months over in Europe broadcasting games. I did the Women's Worlds from Linköping, Sweden. I did the Boys Under 18s from Ceska Budiavica in the Czech Republic. And I did the Men's Worlds uh, in Innsbruck and in Vienna. And David Conti, who's now a scout with the New York Islanders, he's been with Lou Lamorello forever. Yeah. And he actually played at Colgate, by the way, just so you know. Um, <laughs> David, David did an amazing job. But I remember one day we were just sitting in the stands watching practice, just the two of us. Nobody else was around. Right. And he said to me, Crosby's really good, Pierre. I said, thanks for the news flash. Do you get paid for that intel? <laughs> and he started laughing. But he said, you know who I think could be right at the top of this draft? And I said, no, who? He goes, Anse Kopitar. Watch him. Watch him. I watched him a lot in Sweden. He said, I said, I watched him too. I think he's really good. There were two guys that were missed in that draft that should have gone earlier. Mark Stahl and Anse Kopitar. They went right next to each other past the 10th pick. Go yeah, look we, at all the names that were picked before them. Yep. Okay. Before so we, we did this exercise the other day, Pierre. Let's do it with our listeners and viewers right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them right now, just in case they're not familiar. So you you had Sid at number one, Bobby yeah. Ryan. Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson at three. Jack Johnson, three. Benoit Pouliot at four. Four, Minnesota. Carey Price, Montreal at five. Mm -hmm. Gilbert Boulay, six with Columbus. Jack Skill to the Blackhawks at seven. Jack Skilly, Skilly. Jack Skilly. Jack Skilly, yep. And Devin Setaguchi to San Jose, eighth overall. Brian Lee to the Ottawa Senators at ninth overall. Uh, to North Dakota. Yep, Luke, Bert, Luke Berdon, God bless, rest in peace, uh, to the Vancouver yep. Canucks at 10th overall. And then Anze comes in at 11th. Yeah. Yeah. How, how does he drop to 11? I, I this is my point. One guy got it right. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. He, I'm sad. I'll never forget this. Every time I see David, too, Conti, I tell him, 
dude, you had that nail. Like you are so spot on. Yeah. You should that guy should have gone number two in that and, track and probably price at number three when you think about it. So who was David with at that time? Was he with Lou? Uh, Jersey. Okay. So where would they? I mean, where were they picking? Oh, they would have been way deeper in the draft. Those were yeah. like, Jersey. They were down at 23, so they would have had to make a hell of a trade yeah, to get they out had there. To jump up, but I'm just telling you, if you do that draft over again, you probably have Crosby one, Kopitar two, Carey Price probably three, right? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And then Mark Stahl has to be. Yep. Right? I yeah. Mean, I would say Mark Stahl's still playing. Yep. I mean, come on. I think I think Tuka Rask could be a little higher than 21. Well, so the mistake on Tuka was coming out of the 06 World Junior. You need to know this. He was the goalie of the tournament, and Toronto had to choose. Do we keep Justin Pogge or do we keep Tuka Rask? I, mean, I know this. <laughs> and they took Justin Pogge, and they, the rest is history. They traded Tuka. Obviously, the boss and for Andrew Raycroft. Yeah. I mean, I am doing this without notes, Jimmy. I'm just telling you, like, I remember yeah, these things. I know. Is it, it, Matt, th those were, like, those were big deals, Jimmy. And then, of course, Tuka comes out to beat them, like, what, three, four times in the playoffs during his career in those seven-game series? You, you just wonder. That never happens. Is there still a curse going on in Toronto right now, or have they had a cup already? But – Hey, hindsight's 2020. That that's is how And that's why you got to believe in the eye test here, right? Well, that's, I'm just, I mean, I give, I want to give Conti a ton of credit because all those, he did all that heavy lifting and he was, let's get him on here. Let's get him on sometime. I would love that. You know what? He probably watches a show because a lot of the scouts watch and yeah. they, yeah. they tell you all the time. Oh, yeah. We, we actually respect the scouting fraternity. We oh, think it's really important. We embrace them. I'm, yes. no, I'm nowhere without them, man. They're they're great. They teach me so much when I'm up there. The, phenomenal. You know, Les Conway always told me, Pierre, he said, when you're at the games, if it's not distracting from your writing, if you're not on deadline or it's not going to affect that, go sit with the scouts. Yeah, you know and what? Just, just be a fly people. on the wall and let them show you the game through their lens, and you will learn so much and become such a better hockey writer. And I couldn't agree like, more. Well, Brock Russ was so good anyways. He was such a good person to be around. I, I had many good visits with him, as you know. But, uh, but uh, no, I, he was right on on that. I mean, yep. I, I defy people. All these people are experts, you know, on the Internet. Go sit with a scout and, and pick his brain and see. Just see what they know. You would yep. be amazed. And you, as you know, Jimmy, yeah, how smart some of these guys are. Oh, yeah. They're really smart, and they're dedicated to their craft. And, and there's so many of them too, Pierre. Now, you know, for what you know, some reasons I, we won't get into, but they're not just scouting pro NHL and AHL. A lot of them dabbing into college at the same time right now. They're bouncing around from college to AHL to NHL. So when guys are coming up, you know, if the Bruins make a call up, and I don't know much about a guy, or they they sign a guy out of college and they bring him in, that's where I'm going. I'm going right to scouts row, and I'm learning. And that's where or I'm you're, getting my, you're calling me late at night to drive me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I've got that now. That's the best asset anyone could have. But uh, no, no. Great. I love it when you when I see the phone ringing late at night when I'm watching a game and it's you. I'm like, okay, something's going on. I love it. I just think. It's Speaking great. of, we got to have one of those talks after because I got a little tip that I can't talk about right now. But, I, I, you know, I get yeah, it, so there's a I there's get a certain it. player I got to ask about. Okay. All right, let's open it up to questions here on the eye test on the Sick Podcast Network. But before we do, before, before, before. Yes. remember Randy Workman from Calgary yesterday yes. said, "What about the Lee hit?" I, I was just going to go there. Oh, so, there. so you go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. I oh, it's okay. So I want to, you know, I I didn't have the clip to bring it up here, but Randy was talking about the Anders Lee knee on knee on. on but he didn't on. use the name Anders Lee. He said the Lee hit. Yeah, so we oh, were confused. What Lee? Were, which Lee are you talking about? So. Yeah. And now we know. We talk about now Brian know. Lee just now. <laughs> so, anyhow, but I want to say my take on that hit, Pierre, avoidable. Horrible, no, but avoidable. Oh, avoidable. But yeah. I, it was definitely leg on leg. Yes. You, you, yeah, I mean, could it have been avoided? Yes. yes. Okay, here's the one thing I want to ask, Pierre, okay? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not killing Anders Lee here. I'm not killing... Uh, who was it the other day? It was uh, Eric Johnson on Brad Marchand. And there were a couple more in the last week. What's up with this all of a sudden? There's a lot of knee on knees going on. Is it just the intensity rack racketing up, you know, and everyone's getting 
in a playoff race here. Is that yes. it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, I hate space, man. So this is a time of year where you hear these coaches all the time. If you were down at ice level, you got to gap up, you got to gap up, close the gap, close the gap. Okay. So guys go to do that to take away space. And some of these guys are really fast now. It's not like the old days where they were a little slower and they had the red line. So yeah. that slowed everything down. It's, you know, and you, you had to, it's hard to do now. It, 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 yeah. To establish that physical presence, it's hard to do. When they yeah. tell you from the bench, gap up, gap up, it's yeah. not that easy. I hear you. Well, you know what, Pierre? Again, I want to remind everyone, if uh, if you aren't going to be able to make it to the regionals uh, in person, you're going to be watching on TV, we'll kick back with some factor meals. Let's pull that up right now and tell them about our sponsor, Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. Head to factormeals.com slash itest50 and use the code itest50 to get 50% off. We're going to have to send some, like we said yesterday, we're going to send some to Scotty Bowman. I'm sure he would enjoy those watching. No, I'm, I'm going to hand hours. deliver them because he's down in Sarasota right now. I might just <laughs> go and deliver them. There we go. Well, they have those boxes that they sent in us. They're uh, with the freezer in it and everything. It was great. It's amazing. It is amazing. It's it was truly. a good job. And, of course, we want to thank our other uh, sponsor as well, Manscaped out there right now. Let's pull that up. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Go to manscaped.com and use the code ITEST for 20% off and free shipping. Again, that's manscaped.com. The code is ITEST for 20% off and free shipping. All right, let's open it up to questions here because I see them starting to pile up. Let's get right to it. Marvin Matthews, any thoughts? I'm so glad you asked this question. Any yes. thoughts on Jonathan Drew's comeback here in Colorado? Before you answer, Pierre, and we kind of touched on it yesterday, I, I love it. It's a great story. And as you pointed out yesterday, I think one person that can't be ignored in this story is Nathan McKinnon. When yeah. he became a free agent, he recruited him. And he said, you might, according to Nathan McKinnon, I saw the interview the other day. He said he took less to come to Colorado to play with his old teammate from junior hockey. And it has really worked out. And, you know, I know Canadians fans, it didn't work out there for him in Montreal. I understand the frustration. And I know that he was traded for Sergachev. And, you know, history's history. You can't change it. But I'm telling you, I got to interview Jonathan Druin plenty over the years. And he's a class act. He's a good kid. And, you know, he, of course, wanted things to go differently as well. But if you're a fan of hockey, you're a fan of people, you got to love this story right now. I think it's one of the best comeback stories. And I would think he will be the nominee out of Colorado for the Masterton Trophy, Pierre. Yeah, that I don't know. But here's what I would say is he picked the right team to go to. His agent, Alan Walsh, deserves some credit on that. Uh, Alan does really hard work for most yes, most does. agents do for his constituents and he believes in them and he fights for them and he's yep. outspoken about them and that's his job. Um, but, you know, the truth is, is that he picked the right team and he's really fortunate to have Nathan McKinnon, you know, making sure that he's looking better and better all the time talking about drawing. And I think Nathan's done a fantastic job with him. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Next question. 87 Eagles asks, hey, guys, I was wondering how many games BU has left, if any, and when is the earliest possibility that Hudson could join the Habs? Do you think he would go immediately to the PP? Have a great night. So BU, play, BU will play their first game uh, of the regional against RIT in Sioux Falls. They should win that game. That doesn't mean they will, but they should. If they lose that game, they're eliminated. If they win that game – They'll play the winner of Minnesota and Omaha. On Sunday, so, right? Yeah, on Sunday. So they still have at least one game left and maybe two and maybe, maybe two more after that. Do I see him going on the power play when he gets there? The answer is yes, I do. Do I see the Canadians dressing 11 forwards and seven defensemen? Yes, I do. Tampa's done it forever, and it works really well for them. Um, but I, I definitely see him putting on a Canadian sweater as soon as his college season is over. Yep, I'm with you. All right, next question. Vincent Joyelle says, Hello, gentlemen. Thanks again. If you were the GM of the Habs and could only keep one D-man prospect considering who is on the NHL roster, who would you keep? Reinbacker, Hudson, or Mayu? Is that for me? Yeah, we'll let you take it, Pierre. I mean, it's a hard question because I like all three, but I'd keep Mayu. Okay. Wow. Interesting. And that is why? He packs a punch. 
All right. Tough kid. More, more well-rounded. Yeah, he's a he's a multi-dimensional weapon. You okay. know, I think long term he's going to be really good, really really good. Not that Hudson's not, and not that Reinbacher's not. I was only allowed to keep one based you're on the question. To keep one because you were honest. I clear. <laughs> <laughs> but let's be let's tell the truth. You're going to keep all. <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you. But it, yeah. based on the question that the gentleman asked, more I keep one. Yeah. All right. You know, we'll get to it tomorrow, Pierre. I want to talk about Mike Matheson tomorrow, too. I think it's a good topic to bring up. That's very good. I agree. Yeah. I agree. All right. Next question. Jeffrey B., huge game yeah. between Detroit and Washington tonight. You oh, yeah. Correct. We're both fighting for that last wild card spot. Who do you see on each team needs to put their team on their back? I'm going to say, Pierre, before you say it, I'm going to say for Detroit, and I he did he, he got in a fight the other day and he proved he can chuck him. I want to see a huge game from Moritz Sider. He's had, I think he would admit, not the year he wanted. I want to see him really step it up right now down the stretch here for the Wings. And on Washington, um, I mean, Ovi, right? And he's been doing it lately. He seems rejuvenated. I think that continues tonight as well. So for Detroit, I'm going to say Dylan Larkin. Okay. I think Dylan's got to really take this team and put it on its back because he makes everybody around him better, and he can back off the Washington defense. And because I picked Dylan Larkin, I'm going to say Johnny Carlson for Washington. Ooh, he's yeah. going to have to be stout defensively, and he's going to have to produce points in the power play. So I, I think both those guys can have a massive impact on the game tonight, and they have to if yeah. their respective teams are going to win. Good stuff. I love having these great games right now at this time of year. All right, next question. What do we got? Anything? I think we're good. Well, I'll elaborate, too, on that, that game, Pierre. The other thing, too, I look at the goalies. And – I would give Washington the edge as we currently speak. Given well, how Lindgren, Lindgren's, he's played great. Charlie's been wow. awesome. He's another great story uh, to talk Charlie's about. Been fantastic. Yeah, no, he's been really good. Um, yep. I mean, you know, the truth is Detroit's got to get real good goaltending if they're going to be a playoff team. They do. I mean, yeah. whoever, whoever would have thought that, they would have this meltdown. And I think it's not so much a meltdown. It was the injury to Dylan Larkin. Mm -hmm. You know, they lost him for two and a half weeks. That really set them back. Yeah. It really yeah. set them back. Um, hey, let's look around right now. I'll pull up the schedule for tonight. I mean, there there are some crucial games tonight, Pierre. Well, here's one I'll tell you right now. Carolina plays in Pittsburgh tonight. Jake Gensel's going back to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. You can only imagine the emotion that's going to be in that building. Oh, Pittsburgh yeah. had a 4 nothing lead in their last game on the road in Colorado on national TV. They lost the lead and they lost the game. They they better not lay an egg tonight with Gensel yeah. coming back into town. And there better be an A-plus effort from every player playing that's wearing a Pittsburgh Penguins sweater tonight. Because I I was just in Pittsburgh, as you know, Jimmy, doing Mario Lemieux's fantasy camp. And, and the passion of the fan base is off the charts. And they want to win. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're making the playoffs. I think you would agree with me, but they want to win. And yeah. they're, they've wasted an, almost an MVP like season for Sidney Crosby as a team. Yeah. They've yeah. wasted that. It's, it's sad. It's really sad. So, Pierre, you know, going back to that Detroit Washington game, I'll loop it in with another game that's really connected is the Philly Rangers game right now. Because if Washington wins, okay, they're at 79 points. They will slide in to the three slot in the Metro division tied with Philadelphia if Philly loses to the Rangers. At New York, by the way. That game's in New at York. At New York. And the Rangers, of course, are in a battle with the Bruins and the, and the Panthers uh, for that top slot in the East. So they want this game just as bad. And Philly is just starting to really slide right there, Pierre. I, I don't think, you know, a couple of weeks ago that they thought, whoa, we could be on the verge of falling out of the playoffs uh, when we got to this day. And so this that's a huge game for Philly right now because if they lose, I don't know, man, I think they just keep sliding, Pierre. I'm, I'm worried about that team right now. Well, look, let's be fair to John Tortorella and to Daniel Briere and to Keith Jones. They've, look at that team. They've over, overachieved. They've overachieved the whole year. Yeah. Um, and they got a lot of kids. They're not a lot of veteran players on that team. Those are kids. Yeah. And so 
there's a fatigue factor that goes into overachieving every night. So uh, John's coached him as well as I've ever seen John coach. And I mean that. And, and I, look, at I coached against John. John's a really good coach. Um, tons of respect for him. And I just think they might be running out of gas. And let's not forget the Carter Hart situation. Mm -hmm. You know, that exposed some of their goaltending as well. You know, Carter's are starting goalie. He's not now, and he may never be again. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, too, bogus. I don't know if you saw up here, but there was a really bogus rumor going around that he's heading to the KHL. And, you know, for whoever was believing it, explain to me how the legal authorities are going to allow him to leave the country right now. Yeah, I don't know. Right there, that ends that rumor. Just ass night. Anyhow, um, no, but yeah, you look at that. And the other thing I want to talk about the Flyers, Pierre, and it was. It was hilarious. Did you see the press conference last night or the other night after the game when somebody asked him about, uh, I think it was, with, I forget who was in net, but they asked him about the goalies play and he, and then he bit his tongue, took a deep breath and walked off. And, you know, everybody started, oh, here's Tortorella being a jerk again. And I didn't see it that way. I saw it as him not wanting to, throw that attention or throw his goalie under the bus, not wanting to say the wrong thing that could hurt his goalie mentally right now. He's had a couple bad games. I loved it. You know, and I, I and this is coming from the media. Of course I want to quote. I'm a reporter. But I love that move. And actually, Tortorella came out today, I guess, and apologized to the media for that and explained exactly what I just said. So, you know, don't always jump to conclusions that it's just him having an attitude. He's doing things for his team. There's a reason behind it. It's not just to be a jerk. He's not trying yeah. to be a jerk. He's trying to, you know, keep a team together, keep them on the right path. And I, I love the move here. I think in the old days, there were instances where he made it personal with different reporters and mm -hmm. that got him into trouble and it made him frustrated and made him less of a coach. Yeah, it really, it really did. I can tell you that since the Vancouver stuff, which obviously was not good, I mm -hmm. thought he was really good in Columbus. I think he's been really solid yeah. in Philadelphia. I I couldn't believe how come nobody in Toronto got mad at Sheldon Keefe when he sat out TJ Brody. How come nobody like lost uh, their minds there? Yeah, uh, to his defense, it turns out that he's dealing with some mental health issues. Okay, that I didn't know, but I'm just telling okay. you when yeah. he was sat out and it was quote unquote a healthy scratch situation. Yeah, he should have explained that. Okay, I'm just telling you. But well, meanwhile. Maybe. Meanwhile, John sits out Couturier, and he's, you know, the king of the evil empire. I know. Couturier wasn't playing well. He no, won he well wasn't. in like 28 games. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, they won. <laughs> and, I also, and I mean no disrespect to TJ Brody, who I've always respected as a player. He hasn't played well. No. No. He he played, so, you know, at some point they said, okay, you're sitting out now. We find out what yeah, you reported. We just got to make their decisions, you know. Yeah, they, I mean, the best guys for to try to maybe win. I'm, maybe I'm getting old, and I'm I'm just putting myself in the shoes of other people when I when I see things like that before I spout off. But you know, that's they just got a job to do. All right, we got a couple more questions, then we'll wind it down. What do we got, Jeffrey B? Do you see Celebrini staying in BU for another year after being drafted like Owen Power did, or is his game so complete he'll translate to the NHL seamlessly? I think he's going to the NHL, Pierre. Jay Pandolfo would like to say, remember that Owen Power guy? And remember that Kale McCarr guy? <laughs> that McCarr guy stayed and won the Hobie Baker. Owen Power stayed in Michigan, had a really good run. They obviously lost to Denver in the final. Um, I would think that Macklin Celebrini, especially if he's picked by San Jose, I would be absolutely shocked if he didn't leave. Now, to be fair to that, though, as I think about it, Greer is a BU alum. Quinn is a BU alum. Mm -hmm. So maybe they say, we're going to do Jay Pandolfo a solid. We're going to let him stay for another year. I don't think so. I'm saying that tongue in cheek. <laughs> Not considering everything we've discussed lately. <laughs> but that would, uh, I'll tell you one thing. If they get Macklin Celebrini in San Jose, that expedites the rebuild. Mm -hmm. And then it gets it back on track. Yes. It really yeah. does. It really, yeah. truly. You know, I've watched practices, watched yep. games, watched tons of tape. We haven't had one guest on the show that's doubted him, have we? We haven't no. had one, 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 one. So 
he's the real deal. He's an elite player. I would be surprised if he went back to school, but I saw McCarr go back. I saw Power go back. You never know. Else. You never know. All right, final question here. What do we got? 87 Eagles. Do you think the Habs D in two years will be one of the best in the league? P.S. I never miss a show, and I'll say it for you. Smash that like button. Well, thank you. I always forget. I appreciate you telling us to do that. Yeah, smash that like button and, and give us a subscription there. We appreciate it. Pierre, I'll let you take this one. A lot of a lot of questions about the Habs defense today. Yeah, but 87 Eagles has been on it, and uh, he's right on. I would say that uh, if Matheson stays healthy, uh, Gooley keeps going the way he's going, Jack Guy keeps going the way he's going, Ryan Barker, best thing they did was bring him over. Best thing they did was bring him over. Mm -hmm. Mayu's been outstanding in Laval. They're going to play playoff games. Unless something unbelievable happens, Laval's going to make the playoffs, which is great. Uh, Hudson's going to be a power play guy, and I think within two years we'll be able to defend five-on-five, five. not at an elite level, but at a good enough level to survive mm -hmm. uh, in the league. So the answer is yes. I think it'll be one of the best defensive groups in the NHL. They'll be in the top five. They'll be in the top five for sure. Now, you know, again, injuries happen, stuff happens. Don't forget, there's one other part to defense. It's goaltending. Yeah. Jacob Fowler is so good. They've got – He's so me. good. They, they need to be focused on forwards now. Forward they depth. Scoring. They need – but they need they, scoring that's not cheating the game. Yes. And they know that. The, the management – listen, these guys are – I. Uh, you know, there were years where I was like, what is this team doing? Like, they can't yep. get out of their own way. And I used to tell you that. Yep. And people would get mad, and then they wouldn't get out of their own way. And then they'd say, oh, you were right, you were right. I'm not trying to pick a favor. I'm just telling you the facts. These guys, Gordon and, and Hughes, have done a magnificent job with that team. They are. They should, they they should be applauded. I'm so tired of hearing when I was just in Montreal well, with you. And then I, I took my mother out for supper. She lives there. And, uh, you know, I see people and I hear people, oh, the Canadians aren't as good as you say, Pierre. And I said, they're not going to be in the playoffs this year. Yeah. But they're going to have a real chance to push next year. Yeah. They are. And the year after that, they will be in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. They will yeah. be. Well, they're staying the course. And, like, that's that's the key there is just don't let the media or the fans or anyone else dictate what you do. Follow your gut. Follow your plan. And they've done a great job of that so far and I don't see that changing. So yeah. uh, they continue to be on the right path. All right. We want to thank Josh Burlow of the oh, university. Hey, Josh, I hope you're great guest. Thank you. He just, he just emailed too. Yeah. He just emailed and said, thanks. And he loves our enthusiasm for NCAA hockey. We do too. We love the game. Um, and thank our production crew. We want to tell our, our, our friends too in the production crew there that we're, we're thinking of you guys. Uh, we are, you are in our hearts right now. Rosa, we love you, Rosa. We love you. Yes, for sure. We're thanking you, Rosa. Thank you, Anilio. Thank you, Sammy. And thanks to Shane for filling in today. We appreciate him doing the great job he's doing at the Control Center. And thank you to you, the viewers and the listeners, as always. We appreciate your support. As they said there, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. We appreciate it. And again, if you're in the area in Springfield, Mass., on Thursday at noon, we will be at the tap, the tap Sports Bar inside the MGM Casino, broadcasting live ahead of the UMass Denver game. We'll have some great UMass hockey guests joining us there. So come on by, say hello. Looking forward to that. Until tomorrow, though, he's Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. Enjoy the hockey tonight. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.